Good evening. I'm Stephanie Sauvé. I'm the academic dean at Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School. And it is great joy to be in this house this night. I welcome you to the African American Legacy Lectures of CRCDS. This is the time in our lecture week series that we honor African American people who have shaped and honed who we are as an institution. An institution that was the first in the country to have a black church studies program. An institution that has educated and is educating leaders who are pastoral, prophetic, and learned. And I will name some. I'll just call them out as we had modeled this afternoon at the Stuber Lecture. People like Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, Howard Thurman, Samuel DeWitt Proctor, Martin Luther King Jr., James Forbes, <coughs> Harold Carter, Wyatt T. Walker, Samuel McKenney, William Augustus Jones, Johnny Ray Youngblood, William Shaw, H. Beecher Hicks, who spoke here at, as a part of Dr. McMichael's or, uh, installation. And let me add a few other names. Elaine Hawkins, 09 grad, who serves here at Enon Missionary Baptist Church. And let's just add Solomon Cochran, who is currently serving this church in supervised ministry and is planning, and we hope too, will graduate this May. <laughs> the legacy continues, praise God. So welcome this night to the 2014 African American Legacy Lecture. Now I would ask uh, alum Dr. John Walker to offer a word of prayer before our president stands to introduce our speaker. A very pleasant good evening to everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Would you please join me by bowing your heads as we <coughs> lift a prayer to our Father. Our Father in heaven, the Father of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ, we come at this time seeking your guidance, your favor, your grace, and your blessings. This is a momentous evening for us, and we pray that you would be in our midst from beginning until the end. We thank you for those who have come, who have gathered here. We thank you for those who are members of this church. We especially thank you for the leadership given by Dr. James Cherry. Yes. And we pray your blessings upon his footsteps all of his life. Amen. We thank you that our president is here, Dr. McMichael. We thank you that he has graced us along with the dean of that institution that he is identified with, that this church is identified with, that this community is identified with. We thank you for everything. Words cannot express our thanks to you for your mercy and for your graciousness. And we are all amazed because we are so unworthy to have you in our lives. And yet we are, and for that we praise your holy name. We have a gifted speaker with us this evening, a prophet of the ages a man who proclaims your word in spirit and in truth and with courage and with forthrightness. Please encourage him. Be with him. Place the words upon his heart and upon his mouth to speak to us, despite the fact that the sword might have two edges. We pray that you would give him power. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, and we pray that you would just tabernacle with us a little bit. And we promise you 
that all the days of our lives we will give you praise and glory and honor. Through Christ Jesus, our resurrected Lord, and for his sake, we say thank you. Once again, good evening to everybody. It is such a delight to be here. We want to begin by expressing a profound gratitude to Dr. James Cherry, pastor of this church. Let's give him a hand. <clears throat> Who also happens to be a member of the Board of Trustees of Colgate Rochester Crozer Divinity School and uh, there is no more supportive person uh, on our board than Dr. Cherry. Before I introduce uh, our speaker for the evening, I do, as is always my custom, want to introduce those of you who do not know the CRCDS family as well as others to uh, persons who are part of the life of our institution. So I will begin by asking all the members of the teaching faculty of Colgate if they would please stand and uh, except the affirmation of the congregation. They are scattered on both sides. <coughs> and back here. There are others, but they're either on sabbatical or out of town. Uh, we have many members of our board of trustees present. I'd like to ask all the trustees of CRCDS if they would stand, including Dr. Cherry and uh, others who may be here. And uh, seated behind me is Stuart Mitchell, who is the chairman of the Board of Trustees. Tough again, Stuart, so we can prep for you all by yourself. Give Stuart a warm round of applause. Anybody here who is a staff person who holds any administrative or support role? Let's have all of our staff people stand. We are thankful to you for the work that you do. Let's have all of our alumni, if you graduated, and you've made it through, let's have you stand up. All of the alumni of the schools who are here. Wonderful. If you are a current student and you think that by the grace of God you may someday, <laughs> with hard work and perseverance and prayer and long suffering, that you might join the ranks of the alumni. Let's have all of our present students stand up as well. They're up there leaning on one another. Amen. Good to have you here. What is a prophet? Where do they come from? And what do they do when they show up? Make no mistake about it. A prophet is in the house. You will hear more than a 30 second sound bite tonight. You will not hear a point of view that has been pre filtered by Fox News. You are not going to get the gospel according to Rush Limbaugh tonight. <laughs> By God's grace, you are going to get the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to read a few things to you from a book that I wrote that Dr. Jeremiah Wright put a wonderful supporting note on entitled, Where Have All the Prophets Gone? This is a quote from James and Christine Ward, both of them Old Testament scholars. The natural inclination of the Christian community, like all religious communities, to adapt its witness of faith to its most immediate human needs. In 
doing this, the community always runs the risk of obscuring the wider dimensions of the gospel, particularly the wider implications of God's demand for righteousness and justice. What is needed, therefore, is preaching that recovers these wider dimensions and illuminates the ways in which the community obscures them. And then a quote from our friend Cornel West. Prophetic beings, he says, have as their special aim to shatter deliberate ignorance and willful blindness to the sufferings of others and to expose the clever forms of evasion and escape that we devise in order to hide and conceal injustice. He goes on to describe the work of the prophet with this image. It is to stir up in us the courage to care, and empower us to change our lives and our historical circumstances. I present tonight the longtime pastor of the Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago. I present tonight a friend of more than 30 years. I present tonight someone that CRCDS has not run from, but has turned to, to bring us an authentic word that will stir up in us the courage to care and to help us shatter deliberate ignorance and willful blindness. A graduate of Howard University and the University of Chicago, husband, father, grandfather, pastor, prophet. Please join me in extending a warm Rochester welcome to the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright, Jr. <laughs> to our host, Pastor Cherry, to President McMichael, to the faculty, alumni, administration, students of Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School. I wish to thank Dr. McMichael for the invitation to deliver the African American Legacy Lecture of 2014. The title and the text which the Divinity School asked for two weeks ago. Forgetting the fact that black preachers would do it the night before. <laughs> Is African-centered theology in an age of colorblindness, they forgot their story. <laughs> Chancellor Williams and Gardner Taylor provide the prelude for the text. In Chancellor Williams' book, The Destruction of Black Civilization, he narrates in his opening chapter the story of a traveler in West Africa who came upon a griot. And he asked the griot, whatever happened to the people of Sumer? Because sacred history says that those people were black. What happened to them? The griot thought for a while, stroked his chin and said, ah, they forgot their story. And so they died. For any people who forget their own story are dead people. Gardner Taylor 
at a symposium held at ITC in 1999, the black church confronting the 21st century, put on jointly by the Morehouse School of Religion, Carol and Dr. Carolyn Knight. It was a very interesting three-day symposium where there were definite assignments in terms of the black preacher as public theologian, the black preacher as pastoral counselor, the black preacher as homiletician. And in each of those segments, Dr. Taylor could talk for as long as he wanted to talk, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Then three persons were asked to respond to whatever he said, not to bring any prepared notes, but to bring a pen and paper, write down, jot your ideas down as he presented and respond. <coughs> then a break and then another panel, and the panel was composed of six clergy, 10 minutes each, who had written prepared comments concerning that particular topic. Black preacher as public theologian, black preacher as homiletician, black preacher as pastoral counselor, and so forth. Dr. Robert Franklin, who CIC, CDS knows, Otis Moss Jr. and I were to respond to Dr. Taylor as he talked for 20 minutes about the African-American clergy person as public theologian. In the midst of his presentation, I was so overwhelmed, I put my pen down and stopped trying to take notes, hypnotized by what he was saying. He called the name Dr. McMichael of several African-American churches that had when they were founded in the 1800s the word African in their title, but had changed their name and gotten rid of the word African because of what Carter G. Woodson called the miseducation of the Negro, the negative images of Africa. And Dr. Taylor said, I wonder going into the 21st century, will we forget our story? I wonder, will the black church once again turn her back on Africa as she did coming into the 20th century. And then Mark Braverman, he said, no Jew, male or female, would turn their back on Israel, but African Americans turned their back on Africa. Six years ago, during the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference's annual legislative days, held in the nation's capital, prominent scholars of the African American religious tradition from several different disciplines, theologians, church historians, ethicists, professors of Hebrew Bible, professors of New Testament, homiletics, hermeneutics, and historians of religion. Those scholars joined in with sociologists, psychologists, political analysts, local church pastors, and denominational officials from across the ecumenical spectrum to examine the African American religious tradition and its historical, theological, and political contexts. The workshops, the panel discussions, and the symposia examined in much more intricate detail this unknown phenomenon of the black church that I have time to go into in the few moments that we have to share together. The unknown phenomenon of the black church and the African-centered theology that undergirds it is as old as and in some instances is older than this country, the country that we all love and that some of us have served. <coughs> the African American religious tradition is a tradition that is in some ways like Ralph Ellison's The Invisible Man. African-centered theology is also invisible far too many times to the dominant culture while being hidden in plain view. <coughs> The black church and the African-centered theology upon which it is founded have been right here in our midst and on our shores since the 1600s, but they were, have been, and in far too many instances still are invisible to the dominant culture in terms of its rich history, its incredible legacy, and its multiple meanings. The black religious experience and African-centered theology are traditions that at one point in American history were actually called the invisible institution as black worship was forced underground 
of the black codes which prohibited the gathering of more than two black people without a white person being present to monitor the conversation, to monitor the content and the mood of any discourse between persons of African descent in this country. Race, religion, and politics which inform African-centered theology have been a part of this country's history since the 1600s. The black codes that came into being after enslaved Africans tried to break free of chattel slavery in the 1800s with insurrections led by Gabriel Prosper, Denmark, D.C., and Nat Turner, among hundreds more, and fed by David Walker and Harriet Tubman. Those black codes did not kill the religion of the Africans, nor the theology that they embraced. Africans did not stop worshiping because of the black codes. Africans did not stop gathering for inspiration and information and for encouragement and hope in the midst of discouraging and seemingly hopeless circumstances. Africans just gathered out of the eyesight and earshot of those who defined them as less than human. They became, in other words, invisible in and invisible to the eyes of the dominant culture. They gathered to worship in brush arbors or hush arbors where the slaveholders, slave patrols, and Uncle Tom's couldn't hear nobody pray. From the 1700s in North America with the founding of the first legally recognized independent black congregations through the end of the Civil War and the passing of the 13th and 14th Amendments to the Constitution of the United States of America, the black religious experience was informed by, enriched by, expanded by, challenged by, shaped by, and influenced by the influx of Africans from the other two Americas and the Africans brought into this country from the Caribbean, just as they brought their culture and their code languages. They also brought their theology, plus the Africans who were called fresh blacks by the slave traders, those Africans who had not been through the seasoning process of the Middle Passage in the Caribbean colonies, those Africans of the seacoast islands off of Georgia and South Carolina, the Gola or the Geechee people brought into the black religious experience a flavor that other seasoned Africans could not bring. The theology of fresh blacks also impacted the theology of seasoned blacks. It is those various streams of the black religious experience and the theologies which make up that experience which were addressed in summary form two days in the nation's capital in April of 2008. Streams which actually require full courses at the university and graduate school level and themes which could not be fully addressed in a two-day symposium and streams which tragically remain invisible to a dominant culture which knows nothing about those whom Langston Hughes called the darker brother, the darker sister. It is all of those streams that make up this multi-layered and rich tapestry of the black religious experience and African-centered theology. I was assigned the task of opening up that two-day symposium with the hope that the 2008 media attack on the black church just might mean that the reality of the American, African-American church would no longer be invisible. Thinking of the trustees of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Pastors Conference that maybe in 2008, as an honest dialogue about race in this country looked like it was beginning, a dialogue called for by then Senator Obama and a dialogue which began in the United Church of Christ among 5,700 congregations. It was the thinking and the hope that maybe then, as that dialogue began, the religious tradition and the theology that has kept hope alive for people struggling to survive its countless hopeless situations, maybe that religious tradition and that theology will be understood, celebrated, and even embraced by a nation that seems not to have noticed why 11 o'clock on Sunday morning has been called the most segregated hour in America, the result of race, religion, and politics in the black Atlantic. And we have known since 1787 that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour. It was the hope of the Board of Trustees of the Proctor Conference that maybe six years ago we could begin to understand why it is the most segregated hour. And maybe after that conference, we could begin to take steps to move the black religious tradition and to move African-centered theology from the status of invisible to the status of invaluable. 
not just for some black people in this country, but for all people in this country. Maybe this dialogue on race that was supposed to begin an honest dialogue that does not engage in denial or superficial platitudes, maybe this dialogue on race could move the people of faith in this country from various stages of alienation and marginalization to the exciting possibility of reconciliation. That was my hope as I tackled my assignment of opening up that two-day symposium, and I opened it as a pastor and a professor who comes from a long tradition of what I call the African-centered theology of the black church. Now, in the 1960s, as the seminary students and faculty know, the term liberation theology began to gain currency with the writings and the teachings of preachers, pastors, priests, and professors from Latin America. Their theology was done from the underside. Their viewpoint was not from the top down or from the set of teachings which undergirded imperialism. Their viewpoints, rather, were from the bottom up. The theology originated from the thoughts, the understandings of God, the faith, religion, and the Bible from those whose lives were ground under, mangled, marginalized, and destroyed by the ruling classes or the oppressors. Liberation theology started in and started from a different place. It started from the vantage point of the oppressed. My paper, which attempted to summarize a 500-year-old tradition, understanding the limitations of time, I tried to focus in on three areas in that 500-year tradition, a theology of liberation, a theology of transformation, and a theology of reconciliation. In the late 1960s, when Dr. James Cone's powerful books burst onto the scene, the term black liberation theology began to be used. I do not disagree with Dr. Cone, nor do I in any way diminish the inimitable and incomparable contribution Dr. Cone has made and continues to make to the field of theology. Jim, incidentally, is a personal friend of mine. I wrote him a personal note after his last book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, and I told him that that was the best of all of his 14 or 15 books. You have to put that on your personal reading list if you want to understand African Center Theology and the Black Church Proclamation in the year 2014. I don't speak as a theologian, I speak as a historian of religion. And I call our African Center faith tradition the prophetic tradition of the Black Church because I trace its origins back past Jim Cohn. I trace its origins past the sermons and the songs of Africans in bondage in the transatlantic slave trade, or as L.H. Welchel of ITC cautions us, the European slave trade. He cautions us to please stop blaming the Atlantic for slavery. The Atlantic never put anybody in slavery. I trace its origins past the problem of Western ideology and Eurocentric notions of white supremacy, I trace the theology of the black church back to the prophets in the Hebrew Bible and to its last prophet in my tradition, the one we call Jesus of Nazareth. The prophetic tradition of the black church has its roots in Isaiah 61, where God says the prophet is to preach the gospel to the poor and to set at liberty those who are held captive. Liberating the captives also liberates those who are holding them captive. It frees the captives and it frees the captors. It frees the oppressed, and it frees the oppressor. One cannot talk about race, religion, politics, and the black church proclamation without taking seriously what Jerome Ross, Curtis DeYoung, and Alan Buzak stress about the faith that we share. Oppressors and living under oppression are the warp and woof of the biblical faith tradition. Every word in our Bibles, Hebrew Bible, Christian Bible, Every word was written under one of six different kinds of oppression. Egyptian oppression, Assyrian oppression, Babylonian oppression, Persian oppression, Greek oppression, and Roman oppression. From Moses' prophetic message of let my people go, given by God, a message of liberation, to Harriet Tubman's 19 life-threatening trips back into the segregated South to get her people free, the message of liberation has been central in our faith tradition. The prophetic theology of the black church during the days of chattel slavery was a theology of liberation. It was preached to set free those who were held in bondage, spiritually, psychologically, and sometimes physically. And 
it was practice to set the slaveholders free from the notion that they could define other human beings or confine a soul set free by the power of the gospel. The prophetic theology of the black church gave 